Good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you, Sparrows, for that excellent wake-up call. For years, that was our get-out-of-the-hall song. I don't know whether it's get out of the kitchen or get out of the bedroom or get into the living room song now, uh, but we thank you for joining us today in this space and virtually at any other time. You're important to us, and we just thank you for being here. I'm here at Trinity United Methodist Church with the Sparrows, our praise team, and the projectionist, and some other special friends, and we're just glad to be with you today to continue our celebration of the Easter service and to praise the risen Savior. Uh, you probably have noticed by now that I am not Pastor Allen. Uh, I won't compare us physically at all, but he's not here today. Uh, we have worked him like a rented mule for the last six weeks, and he is getting some more than deserved uh, R and R, and we're just thankful that it worked out for him to get that. Uh, Alan, we hope you're enjoying yourself. Uh, I hope you're not too nervous by not being in charge today. And uh, folks, give him a thanks sometime. He does a prayer service every morning, five days a week. Uh, he has all types of other gatherings and worship opportunities for him. And we're just blessed and thankful uh, to have him to lead this congregation. Uh, I'm excited to be with you as one of the two lay leaders here at Trinity, and today we're going to kick off uh, an, a series that will last the rest of the Sundays in April where we visit uh, the resurrection stories. And uh, I will start today with Doubting Thomas, and Alan will continue for the next two Sundays. But in the meantime, uh, we've got our praise band here. They're ready to get us kicked off uh, to start this worship service in the right spirit. So praise team, come forward, kick us off. Those of you at home, get up and get loud. Let's praise the Lord. Free. 
Just to 
thank you sparrows. And now for one of my favorite parts of our service, our special friend Rachel Z is going to come up and give us our children's time. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so today, we're going to be talking about trust and how we can know something is true. So what if I told you I have climbed Mount Everest? Would you believe me? I'm young. I'm agile. I could do it. But though, it's a pretty outrageous claim, right? What if I told you I brushed my teeth this morning? Hopefully that's a little bit more believable, but you still didn't watch me do it, so you'd have to take my word for it. In our gospel lesson today, someone had a hard time believing what others tried to tell him. But in all fairness, it was just about as believable as me having climbed Mount Everest. Today, we're going to talk about a guy named Thomas, also known as Didymus, in the time after Jesus rose from the dead. Last week was Easter, you know, Jesus came back from the tomb, conquered death, and to celebrate, we all ate a chocolate rabbit. It was wonderful. This week's story is what comes after that, of Jesus appearing to his disciples after Easter. It's quite a roller coaster. Imagine watching your beloved teacher die, grieving that loss, only to see him alive again. But one disciple missed out on that last part. He was a little bit late to the party. He wasn't there in the room when Jesus came and didn't see him personally. And he didn't believe what his friends told him about witnessing Jesus. That was their favorite guy who had just died. It sounded like a sick joke. So Thomas promised that he wouldn't believe it until he saw Jesus face to face. And when Jesus did show up later and showed Thomas's wounds, Thomas must have felt a little bit more inclined to believe some outrageous claims after that. But the neat thing is that Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. He commended people who believed him without witnessing face to face. And you know who that is? That's us. Because we haven't physically seen Jesus, but we still believe in him. Well, how? There's this super cool thing called the Bible. We have stories of the Bible, and we know what God's word says is true. In order to trust someone or something, we have to know that it's trustworthy. God has most definitely proven trustworthy. What God says is what God will do, because God's word is real and true. Fantastic poem for you. The Bible gives us great hope. We can't see God necessarily, but we can see the evidence and know that God gives us life. The Bible is given to us so that we can know and believe. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for your love. Help us to believe even in what we cannot see. And thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you want, we could all just go home now. Great job. We appreciate what you had to say. As someone that co-parented three boys, I will assure you that the Mount Everest and toothbrushing comparison may not always be as realistic as you made it sound this morning. But congratulations to everyone for your personal hygiene. Uh, I have told you that we're going to visit the resurrection stories today. And to start with a really bad pun, no doubt there are thousands of Doubting Thomas sermons being preached around the country and around the world today. And as I looked at the scripture this week, it spoke to me a little differently than I've seen it before. And rather than focusing on Thomas as a doubter and focusing on his doubt, I want us to explore this scripture from the perspective of a, a template or a roadmap for how we can grow in our faith and what are the essentials 
uh, when we hit those rough spots, when we've got some doubts, how are we supposed to work through them? How did Thomas and the disciples and Jesus show us to handle those opportunities? Our scripture today is John 20, verses 19 through 31. We join this scripture on the day of Jesus' resurrection. The women had been to the tomb in the morning and reported seeing Jesus to the disciples later in the morning. And now in the afternoon, starting at verse 19, later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath, and he breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins... What are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes, and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, the disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you... So you believe you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in the book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing have real and eternal life the way he personally revealed it. May God bless the reading and hearing and understanding of his word. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. We can certainly identify with aspects of this scripture The disciples are sequestered away, uh, locked down in a room, much like we spent the last year, uh, worrying about what's out there that might kill you. And I want us to examine this story as if we're personally part of it. In Luke, the recount tells how the women encountered Jesus in the garden and went and told the disciples and they didn't believe them. Later in today's scripture when Jesus came to the disciples and showed them his wounds they were excited and they believed. Thomas for whatever reason wasn't there he didn't see Jesus and he didn't believe. I don't know who Thomas had as the press agent, but how the last one that didn't believe became the doubter in that group is amazing to me. But we've hung that moniker on him for centuries now. I want us to look at Thomas's actions, and there's a lot of unknown here, but I want us to to think about that and see what we can use that he did to help us on our faith journeys. Thomas, and we don't know why he wasn't there, we don't know how long he was gone, we don't know what he was doing, 
We don't know why he came back or when he got back. But Thomas returned to his community of faith. And I think that it's important when we hit times of doubt that we return to our church, that we return to our community of believers that we trust and that know us and can counsel and advise us and love us. Thomas checked that box. Thomas was able to communicate the reason for his doubt. He never said he didn't believe anything, but I, I, I believe he was wrestling with the resurrection. He'd studied with Jesus, he'd heard sermons, he'd seen miracles. Jesus had told them that he was going to have to die and to be raised, raised again in three days to fulfill the prophecy, but this was so different. This wasn't hearing the words, this was having seen the Master hanging on the cross with pierced hands and holes in his side. And that's hard to believe. It was hard for any of the 11 remaining disciples. And Thomas chose to communicate exactly what it was that was counting on causing his doubt. And then he was patient. He waited, and you know, eight days seemed like an eternity then, but he waited, and Jesus, as he does, penetrated the locks, came into the hiding place, and ministered to Thomas per personally. Not criticizing, not fussing, just telling him to believe. And as happens frequently in the Bible, they, the Scripture speaks to us personally, I think. It's not written for the, the people gathered uh, in that house with all those locked doors. It's for those of us in the Trinity community today, the same as it was for that group. And the, there's always a but. And Jesus didn't just come to say hello and wish them peace. They came with an assignment. They told them, you know, just as God sent me, I'm sending you. Uh, to me, that's telling all of them, you've been in this room long enough. It's time to get out there and to get some stuff done. And he told them to forgive. Now, I love the way he expressed that because he didn't, I mean, he frankly told me, he said, what are you going to do with sins if you don't forgive them? And we love to hoard sins, our own, we stay embarrassed about them and wish we hadn't done them, and those of others we love to accumulate. And soon we've got a big, big pile of heavy sins, and I cannot think of anything you can do with that pile. You forgive it, you get rid of it, and you walk away without that burden. This is known as one of our low Sundays. Uh, the Sundays after our big church holidays frequently have uh, lower attendances. Uh, the service itself is usually not as elaborate as we've been used to. And we just kind of pause and catch our breath. I see this Sunday as a special challenge for those of us because this, this is the time when Jesus turned his ministry over to the laity. He didn't go to the leaders at the synagogue. He went to the fishermen and the tax collectors and the zealots, and he told them, get out of this room. and I'm sending you to forgive. I think he sends that same challenge to us. We need to be sure that we're faithful in being part of this church community, but there's a bigger community out there, a, a community of people that don't know about Jesus. And it's up to us to get out there and make them want to be part of the faith community by the example we set and by the lives we live and by forgiving and loving freely, and offering that to all of our brothers and sisters, and acknowledging 
that everyone is our brother and sister. Amen. If you have prayer requests, uh, please text them in at this time. Uh, if we don't get them in time to share them this morning, uh, be certain that we will keep up with them and we will be praying for them through the week. Now let's pause. We'll have a moment of silence and then go to prayer. <laughs> Dear Father, thank you for a beautiful moment, morning, a beautiful week, and a time to be with you and in your presence and with other believers this morning. We pray for all the problems uh, we hear of around the world, around the country. Uh, we pray for an end to the gun violence. We pray for a resolution uh, to managing the situation with the immigrants that are being housed and handled so embarrassingly poorly. We pray that you be with us and that we learn to love and to respect each other and that we are diligent in loving you with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. Especially this morning, we lift up Steve Surrett, who's had several surgeries this morning, and uh, we pray for speedy and complete healing for Steve and uh, be with Nadine as she serves as his caretaker. And there are others that we may not know about, but you do, that need your healing, and need your comfort, and just need to feel your presence. Lord, we, we know that you will be with all of them and minister them uh, to meet their needs. Be with us as we continue our Easter celebration and make us remember it's not a special day, uh, it's a special commitment. And help us to live up to that commitment go, going forward into the rest of this, this season and this year. And now we lift up the prayer that your son taught his disciples and we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank y'all. And now we're going to invite the praise team back up for one more song. I'm 
Again, sparrows. Trinity has a long and strong tradition of being active in missions. And for the next several Sundays, uh, the mission committee is going to uh, provide us with some information on some of the many projects in which they're involved. Uh, this morning, Bill Poole is here with us, and he's going to talk with us about one of the projects where he spends time, and that's Project Homes. Bill? Thank you, Richard, and uh, yes, thank you for the uh, Trinity family for the support that uh, you've given uh, Project Homes and, and all the ministries that we do here at church. Uh, Want to put the picture up, uh, please, Turner? Okay, Project Homes um, was founded in 1992, and Trinity has been ministering with them since 2005. Uh, Project Homes does a lot of things that Trinity's not involved with. They build new homes, um, they repair houses, they own four senior citizen apartment projects throughout the community. Uh, they've recently purchased a uh, mobile home park in Chesterfield with a goal towards making improvements there and hopefully even getting the residents newer, uh, safer homes. Uh, they make energy efficiency improvements on people's homes and uh, certainly we work with them building wheelchair ramps. Next, next picture please, Turner. Okay, they call their Renew Crew as a, as a group of volunteers one of the ramps that we have built recently. Uh, Project Homes has built probably 16 or 1700 ramps in the past 15 years, and probably 15 or 20 members of Trinity uh, 
old men like me, women, youth have built probably six to seven hundred of those ramps. Um, we have built ramps for seven or eight families here at, at church itself. Uh, and matter of fact, Pat Madison is still using the one that we built several years ago for her mother. Uh, this recent ramp, uh, the little girl is almost four years old. Uh, the family has had to carry her outside in a very heavy wheelchair. She's on oxygen. Uh, the wheelchair contains a battery and a pump and, and all these kinds of things. And they were um, very nervous that they would hurt themselves or, or their daughter getting her in and out of the house. When mom uh, pulled her up the ramp the first time, she got the biggest, uh, biggest grin on her face that she can imagine. Next slide, please, Turner. Okay, the, the, this is a more typical recipient, somewhat about my age. Um, we certainly think the ramps improve the quality of life, not just the individual that might have the disability, but of the whole family. Um, they provide safety for the family. Um, safety for Hannah, the little four-year-old girl that, you know, she wouldn't be dropped getting carried out of the house. We built a ramp for a family one time. Uh, the individual said they, they had been afraid that if their home caught fire, they couldn't get out. They had no way to get out on their own. Uh, independence. Uh, how many has been bored the past years? You've been stuck at home with COVID. We know that's a temporary situation. Can you imagine if your body has you trapped permanently and you can't get out? One, one lady would build a ramp. She was excited she could go to Walmart. Well, going to Walmart is not my favorite thing, but it was special for her to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Turner. Uh, we're building 125 to 150 ramps a year. Uh, many of the volunteers are corporate volunteers, Capital One, Dominion, uh, Genworth, Westminster Canterbury, send their employees out to build components and build ramps. Next slide, please, Turner. In addition to ramps, we've done some work on minor home repairs, repairing porches, uh, handrails, uh, various things like this. Uh, next slide, please turn to the last one. Um, you might ask why you do this. Well, I, I think I've always wanted to be a carpenter. This is probably as close as I'll ever get. Um, Hannah School, or that little four-year-old girl, and then I think of the best reason probably, um, we'll see what kind of Bible scholars you are. Does anybody here know the text for Matthew 25, verse 36, the last part? I don't either, so I looked it up. I knew it was in there. I wasn't sure where it was. Uh, the last part of uh, that verse says, I was in prison and you came to visit. Well, we visit uh, for two or three hours, uh, not, not to talk, but to make an improvement. And by the, time, by the time our visit is over, we've orchestrated the jailbreak. You know, someone's, someone's out of prison, finally. Thank you. This morning and uh, for all the things you, the Trinity Mission Group does to, to serve the Lord by serving the community. Uh, heartfelt appreciation to all of you. I've got a special friend that agreed to help me this morning and my buddy Abigail Weber is here to bring us some exciting news from the Girl Scouts. Good morning, we're being shy now. Okay. 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 Okay.
Chesterfield. Mr. Chesterfield. And what do they really need? Paper sizes three through six. Okay. Okay. White and good night. Here's a whole April. a box in the hallway where you can donate. So she's doing a diaper drive with her Girl Scout troop, Troop 57. And she will have a bin in the back of church. Um, it's for Family First of Chesterfield. And they are particularly looking for sizes three through six. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Abigail. And we look forward to filling that bin up over the next few weeks, right? Will you be checking on it? Okay. We look forward to working with you. A few other announcements uh, to lift up. Uh, Thursday night will be the uh, finance committee meeting. Uh, please, if you come by the church, uh, look at our nice clean windows and the landscaping work. We had people up here working hard uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, look at the windows, but don't touch them or put your noses on them, please, because they, they really are bright and shiny today. Um, the study on race relations will continue live Wednesday night in one of the back Sunday school rooms. Uh, they are studying the book uh, Be the Bridge. It's available from Amazon as well as other places. Uh, you're encouraged to join the group. Well, this is kind of a fresh starting place. Uh, you'll be right with the rest of us if, if you come this Wednesday. And the pastor has offered to start another group if there's a better time for some of you or uh, you want to be in a, a different and smaller group. Okay. What? All right. So if you guys have been paying attention the last couple of weeks, we've been grateful to have Eric over here with us on the bass, and so he's going to actually start us off on this song. No pressure. <laughs> Yeah. 
leave with this blessing, which is a quote from Abraham Heschel. Our goal should be to live life in radical amazement. Get up in the morning and look at the world in a way that takes nothing for granted. Everything is phenomenal. Everything is incredible. Never treat life casually. Be spiritual is to be amazed. Thank you. Go forward. Have a good week and remember to wear your mask and I when to wear. And I thank you for your indulgence this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen.